Okay, I think we're kind of getting started here. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming here this evening. Um, my name is Carissa. I was once an intern with the Hennepin History Museum here, and I wrapped up my internship um, for my time in my grad program, uh, interning with Mapping Prejudice. And so when I was learning all about the history of Minneapolis, all around north, south, east, west, um, one common thing was, was using the stories of the past to inform and, uh, community folks of the, of the presence and so that we can make these um, more informed, equitable decisions moving forward. Uh, Jose will introduce the, his work on our streets, but that is really coming down to campaigning for um, Olson Memorial Highway. Um, that is a, a pretty dangerous highway running through the community and the, the campaign to transform it to a boulevard to make it safe. Uh, yeah, I think that's it for me. I'll have a person who will say, sorry. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Jose, and I'm the executive director at Our Street Minneapolis. I'm going to do just a brief introduction of the organization and then turn it over to Kristen. Uh, today, we're here to talk about highway removal projects. We are working on one on Olson Memorial Highway and we're also working on one on Interstate 94. Um, we are also responsible for open streets, uh, the summer events, the street closures. Uh, we just finished one on East Lake and then we're doing several others over the summer. We do them every year. We've done them for um, about 12 years now. And then we do um, city and county work mostly to make streets safer and more comfortable for people to walk, bike, and roll and to go from car-centric streets to people-centric streets. Um, at the city level right now, I would just add that uh, we're advocating for a municipal plowing program. We feel like community members should be able to use clean sidewalks um, to get around since we have snow like seven months out of the year. Okay, and uh, I think that covers it all very well. So I think I'm gonna turn it over to Kirsten. Thank you, um, and thank you all for coming out on this beautiful summer night when I know you had other options. <laughs> um, can you all hear me? Is this working yeah. pretty well? Okay, good. Excellent. Um, so, yeah, so thank you so much for, for having uh, me here at the Hennepin History Museum, and it's, it's wonderful to be here with um, Carissa, our wonderful Mapping Prejudice intern, and with Jose, who is our community fellow. Um, so, my name is uh, Kirsten Delagarde, and I'm a public historian, and, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Mapping Prejudice uh, Project, which is based at the University of Minnesota Libraries. So um, since we began in 2016, um, we, our team has been working with community members to um, identify and map racial covenants, which were, um, were clauses that were inserted into property deeds that prohibited people who are not white from, from buying or even occupying certain pieces of land. So the map that we have made together um, with community members is, is meant to be a tool um, for, for people to do a lot of things. One, to dismantle structural racism and racial inequalities. Um, and we also hope, um, and we've, we've observed, that it has allowed people to see and tell new stories about the past that show us how we got to the place that we are today. So um, today I am going to uh, share one of the stories that has emerged um, from the map for me. So um, the story that I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you a story about um, an infamous, um, at one time infamous intersection in Minneapolis, 6th, um, 6th and Lindale, 6th Avenue North. Um, and 6th Avenue North was the commercial spine of the near north side of Minneapolis in the 1920s and 30s. So 6th Avenue North, uh, most people don't know about 6th Avenue North today because it was replaced by Olson Memorial Highway, which was celebrated as the first super highway in Minnesota when it was completed in 1940. Um, so transportation planners and civic leaders used Olson Memorial Highway um, uh, to develop the playbook um, that they would use for freeway construction across the Twin Cities for the next 30 years. So this was the OG freeway in uh, the Twin Cities. So this project was made um, possible by, uh, by a new influx of funds from the, from the federal government, um, which was focused on expanding the nation's uh, network of highways in the 1930s. And this first of its kind infrastructure project 
for Minnesota sought to accomplish two pressing goals, and, and they were this. Um, the first was to build what everyone believed was going to be the transportation network of the future. Um, but the second, and I would argue actually the more pressing priority, um, was to clear what was described by most observers as, and this is the language that people used at the time, a cancerous concentration of urban blight. In other words, this freeway um, was not a road, it was a social engineering project that was intended to remake urban space according to the ideals of early 20th century urban planners. Um, so 6th Avenue North was home to people and activities that civic leaders of all races believe should have no place in a modern progressive city. So 6th Avenue North was called the Avenue. Um, it emerged in the 19-teens and 1920s, um, and its growth was fueled by the same things that, um, that fueled the widespread, of, uh, widespread um, adoption of racial covenants, which is what, what uh, my project studies. Um, and so these ideas that made this neighborhood um, also destroyed this neighborhood eventually. So um, these same ideas made, it, made this neighborhood um, into a top target for urban renewal in the 1930s. So the neighborhood was essentially bulldozed by the ideas about race and place that remade all the American cities um, in, in the early 20th century. So um, part of the reason that I want to tell the story of, of 6th Avenue North, of this neighborhood, is that when people talk about racial justice and, and freeways in, in, twin, in the Twin Cities, they, they focus exclusively on Rondo, right? Most people know um, if you know anything about racial injustice and freeways, you've heard sort of the broad outlines of, 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 of the Rondo neighborhood. So this was the St. Paul neighborhood um, that was home to 80% of the city's black population um, in the 1950s, um, and it was bisected by I-94. Um, and when it was finished, uh, when, the, when the freeway was finished in 1968, it demolished, by the time it was done, it demolished uh, more than three, 300 black-owned businesses and 700 family homes. So, but Rondo is, is just one piece of a much larger um, story, right? Um, it's not just a local story, it's not just a story here. Um, as one news report uh, summed it up very succinctly, um, take any major American city and you're likely to find a historically black neighborhood demolished, slashed in two, or cut off um, from the rest of the, the city by a, by a highway. So I'm going to take it one step further and say, if you take any major metropolitan area, you will find multiple black neighborhoods decimated by highways. Um, so this map here um, shows our contemporary freeway infrastructure overlaid on a fine-grained demographic map of Minneapolis and St. Paul from 1940. So the, per the, lar the darker purple polygons here show where black people were living um, in 1940, and then you see the freeways. So the freeways, I think this map is, is, is a really great example of um, a picture is worth a thousand words in the sense that you can see that the freeways were always intended to do more than, than move cars, right? That, that they were out, they always had um, a lot of other, you know, that they, they, did, they served other purposes too. Um, and I would say that the, in some ways, you can look at all these neighborhoods on this map and you can look at the freeways and the broad outlines of the stories about each of the neighborhoods is, is in some ways similar. But the destruction played out really differently. And, um, and also, today, um, each of these neighborhoods that was destroyed by freeways um, is facing a, di a different future. And one of the main reasons that they're facing different futures, each one of these neighborhoods, is um, because of the way that they are remembered today. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about. This is what, it's our historical memory of these neighborhoods that determines in, much, in a lot of ways what's possible for the future. So today, when I think about Sixth and Lindale, um, I feel like it has been destroyed twice. So first to bulldozers in 1938, and second in our collective memory. So the question is, why has Sixth and Lindale been forgotten? And how does remembering it, how does retrieving or constructing a new collective memory of this area change what we can do in the future? So today, um, it, it's, hard, it's, it's hard to imagine that there was 
a thriving neighborhood here, right? Um, it's, it's almost impossible to find even spectral traces of what was Sixth Avenue North in this contemporary landscape. But there's so much history under this asphalt. Um, but but to, to really start to delve into it, we need, we need historical, historical maps like this Sandbird map um, to guide our journey through space and time. So this is a, a detailed rendering. It's very hard to see. It's the, the building footprints of, of, of the intersection in 1924. Um, uh, but to really understand what we're, you know, what we're looking at here, we need other, we need other accounts. Um, so for one, according to one person who grew up in the, in the neighborhood, his name was um, Clarence Miller, he described um, that intersection that was on the map there as a beautiful and busy intersection that was, he said, a gathering place for the Negroes of Minneapolis and St. Paul. So he was reflecting, when he wrote that, he was reflecting on his childhood um, neighborhood from the vantage point of Los Angeles, where he had relocated in the 1940s and worked until he retired. And that, at that point, when he retired, he turned his attention to um, creating uh, um, his coming of age as a young black man near this intersection on a memory map that is now on display um, at Sumner Library, down in the basement of Sumner Library. Um, he called this memory map Lament of an Intersection. Um, and and that, that map, it had um, detailed renderings of all the buildings and the, all the civic organizations, um, and it also had a lot of text. And in that text, he called it one of the great Negro intersections of the country. It was also, um, this same intersection was also seen as the hub of the Minneapolis Jewish community um, at the time. Ben Broken, who grew up working in his family's uh, deli at 6th and Lindale, remembers almost 10 synagogues within a block of his family's deli, uh, which catered to new Jewish arrivals from Eastern Europe and uh, who were looking for familiar foods. Um, both Miller and Broken describe the sidewalks of 6th Avenue North as bustling with people at all hours of the day and night. Um, and Miller remembers Sundays as, as especially lively. As he said, since black people were restricted from downtown entertainment, the avenue was their only outlet for enjoyment after six days of hard labor on their jobs. Um, Broken said it was because people didn't have television, they didn't have radio, and they didn't have air conditioning, and they had to get out of their houses. Um, but he recalled um, that helped to create a neighborhood that had a really strong social, um, social fabric. He said people were so friendly. Everyone knew their neighbors, not just their immediate neighbors, but their neighbors for, for blocks around. And every corner, he said, had a group discussing the topics of the day. So, so people, um, it wasn't just the people who lived in the neighborhood, but people from um, all over the Twin Cities and actually all over the region were drawn to this corner um, to sin and to, be, and to be saved, to see and be seen. They attended Shabbat services at Knesset Israel Synagogue and they worshiped at Zion, Border, Wayman, or Church of God. They came to the street to watch movies and eat barbecue, chili, or fried chicken. They drank illicit cocktails at the conga and the Blue Lantern while listening to nationally known jazz musicians. So the avenue, it was a kaleidoscope of liberation and terror, creative ferment, and soul-destroying depravity. And for decades, this was the only place in Minneapolis where black people could be served a cocktail. Um, according, again, according to, to Miller, he said, on the avenue, you could buy moonshine at all times of the day or night, or a woman or a man for an hour. It was your choice. The reefer seeds and Bull Durham cigarette papers were free. So this is Miller's map. Um, and uh, I have spent uh, so many hours poring over, over this map because um, it has revealed so many things that you cannot find in any other source um, that, uh, from Minneapolis in terms of, of the history. Um, so the avenue gave people a place to make um, what John Lewis called good trouble. So um, Foster's Sweet Shop is right there. It's one of the highlighted, little highlighted um, boxes um, and it was wedged between a Jewish barber shop and a pool hall. hall. Um, and and this, little, this little square up there was, um, was a place that helped to incubate the modern civil rights movement in Minnesota. Um, it, it, was, it provided a monthly meeting space 
for something that was called the Minnesota Club, which was really just a group of eight people who got together um, to eat ice cream and to strategize about civil rights. And this was, these were the people who would go on to lead the NAACP for decades in Minnesota. Um, and, and this, it's, um, to me, it's extraordinary because um, it shows the importance of space. Like they, that there were, there were no spaces that people could meet to have these kind of meetings, right? Um, and, and I love the fact that the proprietors of this um, little, I'm sure it was very nondescript, um, sweet shop only required that they bought a dish of ice cream in exchange for, for having their meeting there. Um, you can also, I also highlighted Broken's uh, Deli there that Ben Broken talked about. Um, but the, the avenue attracted Jewish and black entrepreneurs who opened kosher delis and butcher stores, um, grocery stores, dry cleaners, and restaurants of all kinds. Um, and, and one of the major landmarks at this intersection was something called the Kistler Building, um, which housed a revolving cast of recreational and civic organizations, including the improved brotherly and paternal order of Elks. OK, so this was the Black Elks. Um, and that meant that they couldn't use any of the Elks facilities downtown. They had to look for other space. So instead, they um, rented the third floor of the Kistler building, um, where they gave dances three nights a week and every holiday. Um, and Miller says, and it was always filled to capacity. In the summer months, before air conditioning, they would raise the windows um, at, to cool and air out the place. Um, he said deodorizers were not invented then, so talcum powder was the thing. Um, and he said, if the wind was blowing towards downtown, you could hear the wailing of the trumpets and the trombones as you came across the 7th um, Street Bridge. So this was a sonic beacon. Um, and it attracted all kinds of uh, musicians to the district. Um, and, and this district actually became the center of the region's uh, jazz scene. Um, it drew musicians like the Pettiford Brothers, um, legendary jazz saxophonist Le Lester Young, and eventually um, John Nelson, uh, a jazz pianist who is best known as the father of Prince. So these musicians um, found gigs uh, in, in the Elks Club um, and the Kit Cat, Cat Club. Um, and they also played in a lot of the neighborhood restaurants um, that served um, Southern style chicken and illegal booze. So Gordon Parks was another musician who was drawn to um, his, this, the neighborhood. And he got his start um, playing piano in a brothel called um, Pope's just down the street. Um, so, so this world on the near, of the near north side of Minneapolis, um, it was a world, this world that um, Miller's map brings back to life for us. It was created um, by people who were seeking physical safety, cultural connection, and economic opportunity. By the 1920s, it was populated by black people with deep Midwestern roots who had been pushed out of smaller towns in the region. And they built a beachhead here at Sixth and Lindale where they lived in community with black migrants from the rural south, people like John Nelson, um, and Jewish refugees from Eastern Europe. Um, so again, like back to this map that I, showed you, that I started out showing you. Um, Sixth and Lindale is up here. And I have come to think of this map as showing um, the archipelago of Twin Cities, um, of black enclaves, right? That this is this, is this archipelago. Um, this, and it's surrounded by the sea of white hostility. So these islands that you see, the purple islands here on the map, um, they rose from the urban landscape in the 1920s. Um, and, and they didn't exist before the 1920s in this way. But they rose because they, um, the built environment of the city was being transformed in, the, in these years. Um, it was being transformed by some really powerful new ideas about urban space. Um, so at the, at the end of the 19th century, um, the United States had gone through this rapid period of urbanization and industrialization. And cities were a mess <laughs> as, a, as a result of that. Um, they were filthy. They were crowded. Um, and in response to that, there was a whole new um, generation of, of experts who, 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 um, who, who, who made it their job to figure out like, how to make cities livable. And they came up with lots of um, new ideas, um, including playgrounds and, um, and lots more green space. Um, but this movement, this new movement to rethink urban space was suffused, it was, it was saturated with scientific racism. So um, this convergence produced 
a critical idea that has shaped cities and neighborhoods for more than a century. And here it is. People need to live with their own kind. Um, neighborhoods where people of different races lived together were unstable and dangerous. Neighborhoods had to be racially homogenous to protect property values. It's that, that idea, that central idea, drove the remaking of American cities. So, the, so the, that, that one idea drove all kinds of new practices. Um, um, and it prompted real estate developers to develop um, a new tool for, making, for remaking cities, and that is the racial covenant. So again, like, this is what our project does, Mapping Prejudice does, is we study racial covenants. We, we work with community members to identify and map racial covenants. And that's, this is what they look like. This is the earliest racial covenant that we have found um, in, in Minnesota so far. It's from 1910. Um, it's for a house in South Minneapolis. And it, and it has this text that um, the, part, the premises shall not at any time be conveyed, mortgaged, or leased to any person or persons of Chinese, Japanese, Moorish, Turkish, Mongolian, or African blood or descent. So, so this was not the only thing. This was a very powerful tool, but it wasn't the only thing. Um, but it, uh, racial covenants worked in concert with other practices like white violence um, and real estate uh, steering, and it transformed um, uh, Minneapolis from a really pretty racially mixed city in 1910 when the first racial covenant was introduced to a, very a fairly segregated city in 1940. So that these two maps show that, that shift. So, on the one hand, um, these are, these are demo core plat demographic maps. You can see that the darker polygons on the left side are, show that there's a distribution of black residents all over the city. By 1940, you can see that people are concentrated. Those, those polygons are darker. That means there's a higher percentage of black residents concentrated in certain neighborhoods. Um, and so 6th Avenue North is here, right? So that's, that's the moment that it, it um, you know, these are the years, the 30 years that this emerged. It, it starts out pretty, you know, pretty lightly colored and becomes more intensely black. So 6th Avenue North becomes one of those islands. Um, and I want, I want to emphasize that um, it was near impossible to, for black people to find places to rent or to live outside of these little enclaves here. Um, and in fact, it wasn't just moving outside or living outside, it was venturing outside of these enclaves. That was, that was perilous. Um, so Minneapolis, uh, you know, walking into this larger sea um, had uh, carried grave risks. So Minneapolis had, at this moment, had 10 active chapters of the Klan. This supposedly secret society, this is a picture from the homecoming parade at, at the University of Minnesota in 1923. Um, this supposedly secret society was highly visible in local politics, in the local police department, and, and even in the school system. So, so this group of racial terrorists made its presence known to residents of North Minneapolis. They, had, they held cross burnings on a hilltop in adjacent Robbinsdale. So we actually tried to figure out whether or not they could be seen from Six and Lindale, and we don't think that they could necessarily, but the message was clear. It was very, it was very close and it was, very, it was adjacent. These nighttime spectacles were intended to send a warning that there was consequences, and, and this is the words of the Klan, for, quote, the dangerous intermingling of white and colored people. Um, and there were, there were consequences for black migrants who asserted equality with white people. So again, these are not idle threats. Um, lynchings, uh, the, the public torture and murder of black people, were common everywhere. There were thousands of these everywhere at the same time. So it's, but it's this larger context um, that helps me to understand why Clarence Miller remembered this neighborhood, remembered the avenue with such affection and nostalgia. Right? It's not just um, it's not just going back to a neighborhood of his youth, but if you, if you, if you think about it in this way, that it is really this safe haven in, the, in, this, larger, in this larger context. Um, so anyone who knows me, well, maybe not anyone who knows me, but most people who have had a longer conversation with, with me could tell you that I've been obsessed with this map since I first, uh, since I first encountered it. Um, it. I just love, I love the visuals of it. I love um, the way it, it um, uh, brings up a, a lost world. Um, I, love, I love his combination of joy and grit 
Um, and, and for me, I feel like this map, I think more than any other source that I've encountered, helped me recast um, my understanding of my hometown of Minneapolis. So I'm a, a white woman who grew up on the south side um, of the city. And um, Miller, Miller's map, this map that he made, um, helped me navigate through a landscape that I feel like has been obscured by the distance of time, racial animus, and deliberate destruction. So, so he paints a portrait through this map of a world that is abs has absolutely been invisible to most people in Minneapolis over the, over the last century. Um, and, the, and the picture that he portrays here is radically different from the way most people understood this neighborhood at the time. Um, so, so before the construction of the very first freeway in the Twin Cities, um, there was this widespread consensus that um, the avenue was everything that Minneapolis should not be, right? Um, and there's no question that it was, it was lawless in, in, in many ways. Um, this, was the, this was the height of prohibition. Um, this was the part of town where speakeasies were, were concentrated. And most, um, most establishments in this neighborhood sold a combination of um, sex, jazz, and illegal booze to an interracial um, group of patrons. So it's easy, it's easy, I think, in some ways for us to romanticize this, you know, to romanticize this um, sexual and social experimentation. Um, it's easy, easy for us to um, sort of poo-poo prohibition, right? Um, but I think for those people who lived in this environment, um, the, the sale of sex and booze deepened the human misery on the avenue. So Harry Davis is, is one of those people, and he would go on to be an influential civil rights leader in, in Minneapolis, and he was the first black person to run for mayor. Um, he was born one block from Sixth and Lindale in 1923, and he described it in the opening pages of his autobiography as the hellhole. He called it the upper Midwest epicenter of vice. So there are a lot of reasons that he felt this way, but I think the number one was that his, his mother was raped and his whole family was traumatized and broken apart by that sexual violence. But he pointed again and again to um, uh, the lack of police protection in the neighborhood um, and, and um, the, the sense, his sense um, that sexual, and, uh, sexual abuse and substance abuse were totally unchecked. Another person, Nelson Peary, um, grew up on the south side of Minneapolis, went on to become an inter internationally known black organizer for the Communist Party. Um, he, he visited the avenue and um, wrote one of the most you know, heart-rending descriptions of the avenue that I have read. He, he called it, he described it be, as being lined with hundreds of ragged, unemployed black men, whorehouses, broken whiskey bottles, and quote, mean cops who fleeced the whores who had money and beat those who didn't. Sylvester Young, another, he's another um, person who spent time, considerable time in the avenue. He was known um, for eventually um, being one of the most prominent black barbers in the Twin Cities. Um, he, he said, it was a really rough and tumble place. I actually saw a guy get killed on the avenue. In fact, one of the bars there was called the Bucket of Blood because there were so many knife fights. So that's a, that's a very different side, right, of, of the avenue. And, and, you know, so even the most affectionate chronicler of this area, Miller, he, called it, he said it was wild. Um, he said, on the avenue, there were always 10 to 15 uh, ladies of the evening strolling to offer enjoyment to any lonely man they could get for a price. So starting in the 1920s, um, social reformers, academics, urban planners began the systematic documentation of the pathologies of Sixth Avenue North and all the people who lived there. Um, so, so this is one of the most notable uh, examples of this. Uh, it's a map that was created in 1925 by uh, a, a very um, well-respected, well-known uh, social reform group called the Women's Cooperative Alliance. Um, and, and it's hard to see, again, like from, from the back, um, but what they have done is they have detailed, um, the, they've done the racial breakdown of who lives where. What the, and, and there's all kinds of sort of um, very offensive <laughs> characterizations of the different populations of people. Um, and they, they offered this map as, they say, as, as, as their, their irrefutable evidence 
that they said the squalor and degradation can scarcely be realized by one who has not lived or worked in this section. And they said from all members of all races comes the opinion that the mixture of races in this district is detrimental. And the situation only grows more serious because they're having, we're having an influx of migrant people. Um, another report says Negroes and whites intermingle sufficiently to result in immorality, prostitution, illegitimacy, intermarriage, race hatr hatreds, etc. Um, so these re reports, um, they just they they regurgitate the orthodoxies of the time, right? About what well, it talks about how these there's a central driving idea that if neighborhoods are racially mixed, they're unstable and unsafe. Um, but but it, you know there, the idea was this: racially mixed neighborhoods led to interracial mixing, interracial mixing led to interracial marriage, interracial marriage led to interracial sex, and interracial sex was the root of social disorder and crime. So it's sex and race. Um, so, um, so again, like the, the, I, I showed you that one map from, the 19, from 1925. Um, so these social reformers worked in tandem with city officials. Um, so the, the city began, began getting really serious in the late 20s and the early 30s um, about its plans to eradicate, eliminate, and abolish slum, uh, slum districts. Um, so, so Sixth and Lindale was the top concern for city officials um, sort of f trying to figure out what to do about what they saw as the deteriorating infrastructure of the city. Um, and and you know, so as part of that, the city made educational films like this one. This is a film that we actually found in the clock tower archive down at, at City Hall. Um, so so it, they, they, they conducted a whole uh, PR campaign that they went out and showed this film to lots of different audiences to explain why they had to do this. Um, and, and they were helped by um, all kinds of maps, other maps that people made. Um, and the redlining maps are perhaps the, wealth, the best, best known of these efforts. Um, so as many of you know, redlining, these Hulk maps were commissioned by the federal government in the 1930s. Um, they, they, um, they were the work of local real estate appraisers. And the, the people who, who made the redlining maps here in Minneapolis, um, of course, described Sixth and Lindale. Um, they said th it was an old residential neighborhood that's full of fine old homes, but the main problem was that it was populated by the poorer class of Jew and colored people. And, and this was enough to earn it a hazardous rating. Um, Hulk maps were not the only thing. Um, there are other maps made by uh, a sociologist named Kelvin Schmid, who was employed by the city of Minneapolis around the ti same time. Um, he made, uh, he published an, uh, an opus uh, of 700 maps that was called the Social Saga of Two, of two Cities. Um, and, and it's one map after another um, that basically uh, helped, again, like helped to pathologize um, Sixth Avenue North. It, 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 and this was a way um, he, ca he called um, Sixth Avenue North slum, Negro district. Um, then he made a special vice area map that, you know, uh, you know zeroed in on Sixth Avenue North. Um, so, I mean, again, like it's all, it, he's, he's, he provides sort of an academic patina over the same message that as long as the avenue, this avenue was thriving, the rest of the city was in trouble, right? Um, so, so, again, like it's not just, but again, I want to make, make clear, it's not just white reformers, it's not just white people in power, um, it was also black activists who felt the same way, um, namely Cecil Newman, he was a black newspaper man. Um, who, who, and civil rights activist who edited the spokesman recorder. He called the, the avenue, quote, a cancerous condition which will eventually reflect shame on an entire community. And he said, the corner of 6th and Lindale is a bad advertisement for the city and should be cleaned up. Okay, you already know the end of the story. It wasn't cleaned up. It was eliminated, right? Um, and I'm telling you the story of 6th Avenue North to, to illuminate a, a bunch of different things, but one is to show how transportation imperatives became intertwined uh, with the mission of urban renewal, which um, you know, black, uh, black intellectuals, black activists would later, um, J James Baldwin would call it Negro removal. Um, so starting in 1936, it started before the highway, um, people were forcibly removed from their homes on the avenue and the adjacent area, which was cleared for Sumner Field housing project. Um, so, so this is what you had, you know, before 1938, 
Um, and you know, construction of the highway began in 1938. Um, it was completed in 1940. The freeway was then widened in 1957, and then again in 1963. Um, but I think, I think again, like um, you remember how I talked about the, the the construction of the highways was meant to accomplish two main goals. One was to build the transportation network of the future, and the second was to remove urban blight. Um, and, and I think this, area, this next aerial view uh, illuminates um, that it did not really accomplish the transportation network piece of it um, because it really shows that it was a highway to nowhere. It's, not, it's a highway from one place to another, but it's not actually connecting things. And seven, um, seven years after it was completed, actually a Minneapolis traffic engineer said um, it was, it's one of the least used um, express thoroughfares in the city. Um, so obviously, it, the construction of the highway cleared all the buildings on 6th Avenue North, but it did not eliminate the human misery um, that, people, that people found so disturbing on, on the avenue. Um, so Harry Davis uh, you know, might have uh, hated the hellhole, but he did not like what came next. So he later reflected, he said, the highway made my neighborhood's main street a thoroughfare where pedestrians were no longer comfortable and retail businesses could no longer thrive. This changed forever the character and livability of the neighborhood. And meanwhile, um, the redevelopment um, or the urban development of near north side trigger, triggered a cycle of housing insecurity for many residents, including um, uh, Frank and Lucille Shaw. So the Shaws had made the avenue their home after moving up river from Louisiana. Um, they, after they were evicted to make way for construction for, for Sumner Field Homes in 1936, um, they spent the next 20 years moving from one address to another. Um, uh, though they remained in the neighborhood, they, they suffered a series of, uh, they suffered serial displacement until the birth of their grandson, Prince Roger Nelson in 1958. So, and, and Prince um, was rooted in the neighborhood and he actually was nurtured. Um, anyone who knows anything about the biography of, of Prince knows that he was nurtured by all those same cultural forces that Miller illuminates on his map. Um, uh, but his grandparents, like so many of their neighbors, had great difficulty finding a place where they could put down long-term roots. And, and, and this, this has massive consequences you know, for people. Um, it wasn't just the Shahs, it was, it was hundreds of people who were moved um, for these redevelopment projects. And public health researchers have, have shown that, the, that it results in very much poorer health, uh, health um, outcomes for people, mental health issues increased violence. Um, oops, I'm, my pages are getting. Uh, so, so the Shahs were, were caught up in, in the first wave of evictions, uh, first wave of uh, urban renewal. Um, and two years later, in 1938, um, newspapers reported that 23 houses and stores on, on 6th Avenue North refused to vacate their properties, which had been condemned for Olson Memorial Highway. Um, one of those people, um, was, his name was um, William Trent, and he said, I've hunted, but I can't find a place. I guess I'll just sit tight. Um, so Trent was black. Um, and this map helps to explain why it was so difficult for him, to find, for him and the Shahs to find a new place to live after the construction of Olson Memorial Highway. Um, what you're seeing here is the, the spread of racial covenants over time through um, Hennepin and Ramsey County. Um, and it shows that there's an ever-growing amount of land that was being reserved through racial covenants for, for the exclusive use of white people. So the same ideas that drove the spread of these covenants also created those black, en the black enclaves like Sixth and, and Lindale. And it was ultimately the same ideas that, um, that, uh, create, that promoted racial covenants that created um, Sixth and Lindale that would lead to the destruction of the neighborhood. And this was just at the, at the moment the, that this neighborhood, you know, Sixth and Lindale was really thoroughly destroyed right at the moment that racial covenants were being made illegal, right? So it's, it's, it's all connected. The freeways build on, on the racial covenant, covenants. Um, so where does that leave us today? Um, so over in St. Paul, the people who are connected to Rondo have worked to mitigate the impact of what scholars now call root shock, you know, the impact of this serial displacement. Um, and in the, in the 50 years since 
Rondo was bisected by um, 94. Um, of, there's a, been a very tight group of activists there who have worked to preserve the social networks and the memory of the neighborhood. Um, and this collective historical memory, understanding what was lost and how it was taken, has provided a foundation for contemporary organizing efforts, which are today really yielding some tangible results. Um, it's, it's providing a frame, a local frame for reparations. So at this moment, um, a study is underway for a large public works project meant to repair the social fabric that was um, a torn by the construction of the freeway. So none of this would be under discussion today without the decades of work by community-based historians who have crafted a collective memory of, of the Rondo neighborhood. So I, what I wanna leave you with, or what I hope we can talk about, is that um, each one of these neighborhoods that was destroyed um, these lost neighborhoods, these neighborhoods that was destroyed by the freeway, have stories that need to be told. Each one of them deserve um, to have their collective, a collective memory um, crafted that honors the full complexity of these neighborhoods. And I think it's important to ask, why don't we know about some of these neighborhoods? Why don't we know the stories of some of these neighborhoods? Why do we know some neighbor about some neighborhoods and not others? And what happens if we do? What happens if we tell new stories um, about the neighborhoods that were destroyed and how does this open up new possibilities for the future. And this is a perfect way for me to hand it off to my collaborator, Jose, who's gonna talk about the future. So, not only has this history been all but erased, in present day, uh, communities rarely understand or realize the harms that continue to emerge as a result of the construction of the highway. So let's start by looking at uh, a, uh, this was on display here during the Human Soul exhibition. Uh, just a little bit of some of the promises that were made when urban highways were first proposed. A lot of these things have basically just proven not to be true. But when we start to consider some of the realities that actually took place, um, really realize that transportation has been Minnesota's biggest greenhouse gas emission sector, and the highways are at the center of it, which means that when you live in a community that was displaced and that is now near a highway like Olson Memorial Highway, um, you're talking about uh, the hottest temperatures in the metro area, we're also talking about the highest asthma hospitalization rates in the metro area. Amongst the lowest uh, life expectancy in the metro area. And some of the households uh, in these areas also have um, the least access to uh, cars. So that means that the highway doesn't even serve them and they are not really able to make use of the highway even though they live right next to it and they're harmed by it every day. Um, we also see that um, we have some of the highest poverty rates in the metro area and um, also coinciding with obviously uh, the lowest incomes. And as uh, Kirsten has explained, uh, because of the racial covenants, this is still the area with uh, one of the highest concentration of BIPOC community members in the metro area. It doesn't stop there. The age of the housing stock in the near north community is much older because of this disinvestment. And after the neighborhoods have, uh, were divided, we can see sort of a comparison here of where Olson is compared to the north loop. Basically, almost the entirety of the north loop is brand new infrastructure. So that disinvestment and that disparity just continues to sort of uh, live in and within the community. Yeah, this is, uh, the red is sort of the oldest housing stock and the blue is the newest sort of uh, infrastructure and the yellow and the green are in between. So most of the investment that has happened is like downtown, the North Loop, um, these areas where the highways sort of lead into. Um, and this is here where Olson is and it has some of the oldest uh, housing stock, especially toward the tail end of the near North community. 
Absolutely. And often it ends up coinciding, coinciding with uh, the communities that were concentrated by the covenants. The other thing that we can observe here is that uh, the median home value in these areas is much lower uh, than in areas that have received more investment. And um, this also um, translates similarly uh, to look at it in a different way, where homes that were redlined are significantly un under median value, whereas covenanted homes are significantly over. One more way to look at it here is in terms of the ability to build uh, generational wealth and come into home ownership, and the impact of the covenants and obviously the living conditions in and around the highway. Um, the people who live in the near north community are some of the most cost burdened community members and also has one of the highest rate of renters who have an inability to become homeowners. Another one of the impacts of this disinvestment is also uh, the distance or accessibility to uh, walkable amenities. So here what we try to do is basically map um, sort of a comparison again of what it is like for people to access uh, amenities in the near north community. And as you start looking at, again, Olsen Highway, they basically all but disappear. Um, the same can be said of access to healthcare. And so um, when you look at the hospital, if again, uh, the community has, uh, is distant from uh, the nearest sort of hospital or clinic, and we went ahead and mapped it uh, against where uh, the racial covenants are, and you see um, there's a little bit more proximity when you live in areas that were protected by the covenants versus uh, virtually no access if you live in the near north community. Additionally, uh, when the Holman Decree was uh, proposed, um, the same situation sort of uh, uh, came to fruition uh, in a new way, even though this was meant to uh, address the harms by uh, bringing forward uh, low-income housing, um, the Sumner field homes were raised and uh, created yet another wave of displacement about 20 years ago. On top of that, Olson Highway is also at the very top of what's called the High Injury Crash Network. It has the highest fatal crashes and injuries in the city of Minneapolis, the intersection of Olson and Lindell. So, while the community was divided, it is also very difficult for people to um, basically cross the street and just have access to their own community. Um, and just recently, actually, uh, we went uh, with Mavi Prejudice and we met a young man of 14 who was hit by a car in April um, because it is just so difficult for young people to get across when they have to go to school. Um, so moving forward, it really just doesn't stop in this community. I don't know what else to say. Um, the light rail was also proposed to go through Olson Memorial Highway. And uh, with that, some of the safety improvements were sort of promised to the community. The community was so surveyed. And um, it was determined in the transportation action plan by the city of Minneapolis that uh, Olson deserved some safety improvements and after many years of planning to route the light rail through Olson Highway, um, those plans were abandoned and uh, a new route emerged. However, um, because of this announcement alone, uh, some speculation started to come through. Some new developments started to come through, um, and it's estimated about uh, 200 uh, uh, low-income immigrant families were displaced because of the new development priced them out of their own neighborhoods. So, this is probably the last, and I think you said twice, it's like the, f the fifth wave of harms and displacement that have come through to the community. So we then, as an organization, became part of the Blue Line Coalition, 
And as part of the Blue Line Coalition, one of the member organizations is Harrison Neighborhood Association. And of course, they have been um, speaking up about the idea of repairing the harms on Olson Highway and also just making Harrison whole after so many empty promises that were not kept. Um, as we started to look at um, uh, their concerns and talk to them about what was going on on Olson Memorial Highway, um, we uh, started to realize that Olson Highway, wide as it is, has less traffic than West Broadway, has less traffic than Lindell Avenue. And part of the reason is because 394 was built a few years after Olson was routed through the near north community. However, as you've seen, uh, the health and safety harms are undeniable. The standard of living in the near north community is lower than almost anywhere in the metro area. When we go canvassing, sometimes we meet folks who lived on 6th Avenue North. And for example, this is just a memory of someone that we met at the door talking about um, what it used to be like to live there. And she's saying, um, they tore it down to put the freeway through it. All of our families lived there. Limit used to be the same way, all kinds of stores and shops. So this memory of walkability and accessibility in a neighborhood that um, was comfortable for people to uh, basically have access to their needs was uh, removed. And so we started asking ourselves the question, you know, um, of how to launch an effort that basically addressed these historic but also present harms, you know, an effort that helped uplift this history and allowed people an opportunity to engage and understand how people lived how the community was destroyed, and also leverage that awareness to create momentum for a future that truly acknowledges, addresses, and repairs the loss. So in collaboration with Harrison Neighborhood Association and the organizations and uh, the other neighborhood groups that are along the Near North community, uh, we launched a project called Bring Back Sixth. And um, we sort of refer to this as a positive vision for the future. And we launched it in two phases. The first phase is to address the safety improvements. Right now, the community in, uh, along also Memorial Highway is in desperate need for some improvements. Uh, most of these just boil down to paint. I'll get into more detail um, here. So these kinds of things like including a bike lane and a dedicated bus lane for people who cannot afford cars um, gives an opportunity to travel a different way. Lowering the speed limit makes it safer. So fatal crashes start to occur after you go above 30 miles an hour. Um, so 25 miles an hour below uh, lead to only injuries if there is a crash. Um, lighting for pedestrians it both improves safety but also accessibility. Mark crosswalks at intersections and makes pedestrians more visible. And uh, pedestrian intervals, that's a wonky way of saying more time to cross the street. Yeah. Um, using uh, visual indicators such as artist designed crosswalks. So I'll show you later what art crosswalks can look like and what they can do. And then of course, um, bollards and adding pedestrian bump outs, basically making the intersections go farther into the road so people can be better seen when cars are driving by or turning the corner. This is what's possible. These are some examples in Kansas City, Missouri, where a recent study found that 17% uh, de decrease in total crashes and 50% decrease in crashes involving pedestrians um, just by using art design crosswalks. And the other nice thing about it is that local community members can get involved in designing murals for their own crosswalks. And we're doing just that. We're working with youth at the Teen Tech Center at Summit Academy and they're designing a mural that we're going to advocate for them to be included as an art crosswalk on Olson Memorial Highway. The next phase is a restored corridor, basically taking all the available land from a highway to avenue conversion and turning it into housing and commerce. So as you can see here, when you sort of diet the highway, it creates an opportunity for redevelopment to basically invest in the community and build back the memory of uh, that community member that we met who was talking about walking along the highway. 
Oftentimes, in communities that have been decimated and oppressed, we also want to make sure we're doing a lot of work to expand imagination. Because oppression can mean that community members themselves often don't know what's possible. Or they don't feel allowed or like it's worth their time to dream of anything positive. So as we canvas, survey, host visioning sessions, we take all of that feedback and rent, render community ideas, amplify their voices, reach out to decision makers, and leverage all of the support to make sure the idea becomes a reality. So these are just some examples of the work that we've done uh, in the community. Um, as you listen to Kirsten, I also hope you start to realize that there's an underlying effort that has to take place. We have to tell a different story because uh, we have to change the narrative. Part of what leads communities to justify or consent to the destruction of poor and working neighborhoods of color is what I sometimes call manufactured consent. From the beginning, we are told stories through media studies, news coverage, and maps that people of color and immigrant people are subhuman. And it works. The narrative spreads quickly so that when the time comes to destroy a vibrant community like the one that lived on 6th Avenue, the Outta community thinks that people who live there are worthless and worth removing. Highway builders and developers are heralded as heroes, whereas community members are reduced to being the villains. This is true today as well. The way North Minneapolis is portrayed does not depict the people who live in the near north as humans. They are depicted as subhuman community that is not worth the trouble of investing, supporting, and repairing. So we have hosted events where people can come look at a mobile museum and learn about the history of 6th Avenue North. The mobile museum will be online tonight. So you can go to our website and start looking at it. We will also have a digital walking tour. So you can go to Olsen Highway and follow the walking tour and relive some of the buildings and the memories that were there. Um, and in particular, I wanna just mention this. Um, we try to facilitate a lot of visioning sessions because when you inspire community or you bring new ideas, they start to uh, react. And that's where a lot of our renderings come from. The ones that you saw are just through feedback and surveys. And the other thing that we try to do is make sure that uh, community members understand the pathways and that these changes are actually feasible today. And that land can be returned to the community for the community to decide what to do with it. These efforts have had enormous impact. The community response has been really positive and quarter partners are working in concert to support these changes and efforts. Um, we have thoroughly canvassed the Near North community and, uh, and you know, these responses have been positive, not just along the highway, but in the representative districts. Um, I think I said this in Sumner Library, um, we're not bad at geometry. This is just <laughs> Bobby Joe's champion district, and he's a representative for Olsen Highway, but we know how to draw squares and rectangles too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so here are some of the things that we've picked up while uh, walking the neighborhood. Number one, it's too dangerous. The neighborhood is divided, and it limits accessibility. Um, when we interview folks, they talk about having to take the bus an hour or two hours just to go to Target uh, to do some shopping. And um, there are still people who live in the community who uh, are from North Minneapolis or they have had several generations and they remember some of these stories and they're excited to see it restored. Um, and of course people uh, feel like the North Side deserves more investment from the city and the state. Um, I'll go through these fairly quickly. From the survey, this is one of my favorite ones. We add all of the above, and people generally choose all of the above to the safety <laughs> improvements because it is just so difficult. Um, some of the things that uh, people put in the comments, um, there's a huge love for the trees that go in through the highway, for example. Um, people talk about raised crosswalks, which is possible with art, art uh, asphalt art. and. Uh, as you can see, most of it revolves around safety and just having access to other modes of transportation. 
uh, once again, strong support uh, for other modes of transportation, which is consistent with the fact that a lot of the people who live there are not car owners. Uh, some of the ideas that it, uh, came out of uh, the surveys, law office, laser tag, arcade, tailor shop, drag cleaners, record store, gift shop, bowling alley, healthcare clinic. I live in North Minneapolis, bowling alley, you have to go really far <laughs> to go bowling. Um, art gallery, um, we're definitely proposing the mobile museum to live in a permanent exhibit uh, in North Minneapolis. Um, pharmacy, uh, small business incubator, gym, deli, if any of you live in areas that were protected by covenants, it sounds familiar because you probably can walk to them or you have easy access to them. But in North Minneapolis, none of this exists. Right. Here are some of the comments on the survey. Um, again, a lot of stories of uh, fatal crashes. Um, a lot of support for the work. And... Um, it's sort of an interesting comparison where um, they're talking about how uh, the disinvestment has also led to sort of a decay on Broadway Avenue. Obviously, they live along Olsen Highway. So um, it, this information and this leverage and these campaigns have had success. Um, the Minnesota Department of Transportation sent a letter of commitment to turn over the highway, and just recently the city of Minneapolis unanimously, unanimously supported um, a resolution to decommission Olson Memorial Highway, which is an important, although symbolic, first step. Uh, this is the whole resolution. I'm not going to read it, but uh, um, it acknowledges all of the harms, and it, um, it asks MnDOT to start uh, turning over the right-of-way, and um, racism urgency about the issue so we're very excited about this uh, uh, this development so um, while the support has been overwhelmingly positive the question of traffic and displacement does come up and it's important to address it the question of traffic is the one we have to answer the most so for the first time we prepared a super graphic that we're going to debut here for you all about something that's called induced demand so, to put it really simply, if you get a bigger house, you buy more stuff to put in it. And the same is true for highways. As you make them wider, people take more trips, and traffic congestion only continues to get worse. On top of that, the reason why we made this graphic is because um, as induced demand starts to take place, all of these health impacts start to worsen. And so it isn't just a matter of more traffic and traffic congestion, it's the fact that you're impacting those same communities that live by the highways. So let's look at an example. This is the Katy Freeway in Houston, Texas. It was expanded to 26 lanes in 2011. In three years, congestion worsened. Um, which is another way of saying they don't work the opposite, however, um, is also true and uh, possible. So highway removal uh, can have significant impacts on the community. The University of Minnesota Duluth conducted a study and did an estimate of a one mile conversion from highway to boulevard um, that would cost about $50 million and the estimated uh, economic benefit is four and a half billion dollars. And again, to say it more simply, highways or right-of-ways don't generate any revenue. They just cost money to repair. Whereas if you repurpose the land for commercial or housing development, for example, um, you start to see economic impacts. And on top of that, you are able to reconnect communities as well and reduce the health impacts. This is also something that's been happening around the world. We work with a, a firm called Tool Design. They've designed 23 highway conversions, I believe, in the United States. Uh, and they've helped us gather some data. This is in San Francisco. Um, that's in Rochester, New York. And you can kind of see an example of how the land can get filled. And this is one of our favorite ones in, in South Korea. Um, the 
the mayor decided to restore a historic creek that was in the area. This is actually, the, you can go look it up, it's the same place. There's a creek and now it just caters to people who want to walk, a shop, um, or use transit. Um, but at this juncture, uh, the pollution was so bad um, that they had to uh, rethink what was going on with traffic and they decided to replace it all together. And so, then the question of, well, what happens to the traffic itself? And like we were talking about before, uh, people don't just choose to drive other ways, they choose to stop driving altogether. And that's called traffic evaporation. When you present them with other uh, opportunities to walk places and you build density and proximity into their communities, um, they go out into the world and they just choose to, to leave their cars at home. Imagine, again, living in an area where your doctor or your grocery store or the bowling alley are 10 minutes walking away, you might think a little bit less about driving, you might think a little bit more about walking. And with streets themselves are designed, universally designed, where they're accessible uh, to people with disabilities, um, then that encourages more of the population to use different modes of transportation. So again, this is called traffic evaporation. And we looked at an old study that showed that evaporation can happen between 48 hours and a week. It takes very little time. And if you think, I've never experienced this, you sure have. You probably have just taken a different driving route. When streets are closed for construction, guess what? People stop using them and they forget that they're there for them to use. That's how traffic evaporation works. When you replace them with density and walkability, um, people then go back into the corridor and make different choices. So, the other question that comes up is what about highway mitigation? Um, so highway mitigation is often used as a tool to unfortunately tokenize communities that have been harmed and connect them through bridges, sunken highways, tunnels or caps and justify continued highway expansion. So it is a way to keep a highway in place and rebuild it um, while partially connecting communities either through walking, sometimes driving, or actually building um, neighborhoods on top of the highways. And so, um, as you can see though, they don't go quite as far as a conversion because in, uh, primarily they leave a lot of the health impact in place, the health impacts that are brought on by the traffic itself. And so, um, on the other hand, as you saw in the Duluth example, conversions significantly reduce the health impacts and also bring about uh, economic improvement. So this kind of brings us to two moral questions. The first question is, when communities and areas protected by covenants have never had to worry about health impacts and have enjoyed economic stability and walkable amenities as well as generational wealth, why are we asking communities of color and immigrant communities that were harmed by racial covenants, redlining, terror lynchings, highway construction, and the resulting health impacts to continue to live in substandard conditions? Why not replace the highway to allow them to enjoy the same benefits that, afford, that were afforded to wealthy white communities? It's also true that historically, when development and amenities are introduced, neighborhoods are displaced and gentrified. Simply put, when you make things nice, prices go up, people get run out of those neighborhoods. And so we work very hard as an organization um, to produce community benchmarks. We have a six page PDF on the website, you can knock yourself out, to make sure that these kinds of conversions and the benefits that would come from them stay with the communities that are impacted, that these amenities are actually affordable and accessible and adequate for the communities that have been historically harmed. So we believe as an organization that you have to move all of the solutions together to make sure that if you're asking for changes, that the resulting impacts of those changes are to community benefit. And, um, The number one question that we get, to kind of go back a little bit to traffic, is how much longer is it going to take me to drive down Olson Memorial Highway? Mm -hmm. Which leads to the other moral question. What is it worth to slow down traffic and replace lanes with bus lanes, back lanes, housing and businesses? Is it worth driving a few extra minutes 
knowing that the health and safety of the communities are improved, and knowing that the community might be repaired and restored. Mm -hmm. So that's the question. Would you give up three to five minutes of driving time to see these communities repair and restore? Mm -hmm. um, we have received a lot of support uh, for the asphalt art that I was talking about. Um, we actually received an email from the Minnesota Department of Transportation that they're going to make way for that, perhaps later this year. So things are progressing. These are uh, the organizations that um, have partnered or supported. Um, aside, from, aside from the park board, which is a big supporter, all of these are along the highway. It has been full consensus and unanimous support for these changes within the community. Uh, here's just another example. We're doing this work right now. And um, I wouldn't be a good advocate if I didn't bring the the right advocacy questions, how can you get involved? Come hang out with us, meet the community members, take an action step, email your decision makers, uh, come to some of our events. And if you want to have a look at the Mobile History Museum, come to Open Streets. Mappy Prejudice was there, um, and it was great to have people come through our area and tell them to go talk to the folks at Mappy Prejudice so they can learn more about the covenants and get plugged in with that. And if you have any more questions, I think you saw Kirsten's information, but you can also reach me uh, at my email, and I will try to promptly answer. Thank you so much for having us, and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak about this issue. Thank you so much to Kirsten, yeah. might be prejudiced, and of course, Rag Heritage Studies of Public History for um, all the combined efforts to put this together for you all. Yeah.